So good morning to all of you. Dear Minister, dear Ambassador, dear Chair of the Kosovo Judicial Council, Deputy Chair of the Kosovo Prosecutorial Council, uh, Director of Kosovo Police's Crime Investigation Division, um, dear Head of the Special Prosecution, President of the Pristina Basic Court, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have all of you here today with us for the presentation of ULEX's Justice Monitoring Report. Uh, before giving the floor to our Head of Mission, let me uh, mention a couple of things. Uh, so there are translations available. Channel 1 is Albanian, Channel 2 is English, Channel 3 is Serbian. Uh, if there is something wrong, please let my colleagues know. Uh, for those of you who follow the presentation via Zoom, there is also interpretation available in case you encounter any technical difficulties, please send us a message uh, in the chat. Uh, you have all received the press kit. The press kit includes, uh, among other things, the report that we will be presenting today, as well as a fact sheet that includes the main findings and recommendations. For those of you who watch either via Facebook or Zoom, you may find the report online. It's already on ULEX's website under publications. Um, Last but not least, due to COVID, I would like to kindly ask all of you to keep your masks on at all times and keep social distance. Without further ado, I'd like to give the floor now to uh, the head of ULEX. Please, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Could you please come here? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming here today. Uh, Honorable Minister, thank you in particular for your presence here today. We are aware of your busy schedule. Uh, it's also a pleasure to welcome the chairperson of the Kosovo Judicial Council, Mr. Sogai, and the deputy chair of the Kosovo Prosecutorial Council, Mr. Shabani. We also have here with us today the head of the Special Prosecution, SPRK, Mr. Isufai, and the President of the Basic Court in Pristina, Mr. Rama. And also welcome Lieutenant Colonel Makoli from the Kosovo Police. And of course, representatives of Kosovo civil society organizations. Unfortunately, due to the COVID restrictions, uh, many of you cannot be here today, but um, I know that you're joining us online, or I hope so. Um, and this is a report very much for you and for the public of Kosovo. I'd also like to extend a welcome to our international partners here, um, United Nations, OSCE, and others, including also colleagues from the EU and EUSR office here in Pristina. I am pleased to present to you today the second public systemic and thematic justice monitoring report, a very long title, prepared by the European Union Rule of Law Mission here in Kosovo, also known as EULEX, of course. Since early 2019, the EU Rule of Law Mission has produced five such reports. The first three were only shared with the Ministry of Justice of Kosovo, the Kosovo Judicial Council, the Kosovo Prosecutorial Council, and other relevant Kosovo institutions as well as international organizations active in the justice area. In October 2020, that is just over a year ago, the mission presented its first ever public justice monitoring report. We felt it was high time to make the results of our monitoring work of the Kosovo police, Kosovo's prosecution, and the judiciary in general, available also to the Kosovo public, and to be more transparent about our findings. Given the positive feedback from this report, we are today continuing this practice, making the EU rule of law missions work to strengthen the Kosovo justice system as transparent as possible. We are using a one-of-a-kind methodology which we call robust monitoring of, and this monitoring takes place of selected criminal and civil cases, including many high-profile cases and cases previously dealt with 
by the EU rule of law mission until June 2018, when we gave up our executive mandate in the judiciary. This unique methodology is centered on two features. Firstly, the EU rule of law mission and its monitors is granted full access to the judicial, prosecutorial, and police systems by the Kosovo authorities and as part of the mission's mandate. This provides our monitors with a deep understanding of the functioning of Kosovo's rule of law systems. These insights are coupled with a special responsibility for the mission's monitors and the mission in general to at all times respect the independence and impartiality of the rule of law institutions. EULEX no longer has an executive mandate in the judiciary, although this is not always well understood here in Kosovo. We can therefore not directly interfere in ongoing judicial proceedings. What we can do is provide an analysis and recommendations, which in my humble opinion can be very useful for any reforms of the judiciary and the rule of law systems, accountability, efficiency, and integrity. The monitoring can only work if there is full cooperation and support from our counterparts in the Kosovo police, Kosovo's prosecutorial services, and judicial counterparts in the courts and elsewhere. Due to the cooperation and support that we are given by our Kosovo counterparts, so far this feature of the robust monitoring is working well. Secondly, the EU rule of law missions monitoring covers the entire chain of the criminal justice system, relying on our EU member states, police, prosecution and judicial experts who have been seconded here to Kosovo by the member states and who are working closely with our Kosovo counterparts to understand how the rule of law system is operating. By covering this entire chain of justice, the mission is able to assess its functioning from the early preliminary investigation stage by the police until the execution of a sentence based on a final court judgment. In fact, we also monitor the penitentiary system, Kosovo's correctional services. This, I would argue, unique insight allows the mission to provide targeted and realistic recommendations. Taken together, these two elements of the robust monitoring provides an added value. It is complementing the work of the Kosovo civil society and other international organizations engaged in their own monitoring and activities following the Kosovo judiciary. Furthermore, the justice monitoring engaged by the EU rule of law mission focuses on both systemic and thematic issues. Relying on its continued monitoring of specific cases over time not just coming in for a few days or a few weeks over times, often over years, the mission is able to identify positive and negative trends affecting the overall functioning and integrity of the justice system. At the same time, we have dedicated experts looking at several thematic areas, such as corruption, war crimes, privatization and property rights, and gender-based violence. Most importantly, since the start of the monitoring, we have established an open, constructive, and I would say trust-based cooperation with our Kosovo partners. They have endorsed and followed up on some, not all, but some of the mission's findings and recommendations. And I would like to pay tribute to the Kosovo judiciary, prosecution, and the Kosovo police for taking on board some of our recommendations. For instance, 
the Kosovo Police Anti-Corruption Task Force, now rebranded, to use a modern word, as a special investigation unit, was under serious threat of being shut down at the time of the launch of our first public justice monitoring report in October last year. At the same time, if you go back and read that report, you will see that the mission's recommendations are in fact to strengthen this task force to fight corruption in Kosovo. Corruption is, as we all know, unfortunately still prevalent, not just here in Kosovo. It's something we also have to deal with and fight against inside the European Union. And shutting down a dedicated corruption task force did not bode well for the fight against corruption. The government's decision at the time resulted in a, I must say, well-coordinated reaction by the wider so-called international community and, most importantly, also by Kosovo's own civil society, ultimately ensuring that the former task force was rebranded as a special investigation unit, as it's now called, and it is still functioning. In fact, according to our observations, the coordination and cooperation between the Special Prosecution, the SPRK, and the Special Investigation Unit, as it's now called, the former task force for, to fight corruption, has to a certain extent improved. It is well known that without close cooperation between prosecutors and police investigators, justice in all its aspects will always suffer. Justice itself will suffer. And even the slightest improvement in this essential relationship is therefore welcome. The mission is aware of that the future of the Special Investigation Unit is once again being debated as part of upcoming reforms. This is normal. Debate is welcome. Everything should be examined. And in this light, I would simply like to emphasize that whatever the future of the Special Investigation Unit may bring, the ongoing investigations themselves, the investigations that have been carried out for a long period of time, first by the task force, now by the Special Unit, should continue without any further delays and with adequate support in terms of staff and resources. If these investigations were to be carried out to their logical conclusion, it would be a major step forward in the fight against corruption in Kosovo. One of the most striking concerns from a human rights perspective in the report we are presenting today is the excessive length of so-called detention on remand without a final judgment. And I've already discussed this with Mr. Sogai from the Kosovo Judicial Council. He's well aware of it. The mission has identified so far at least 37 cases in which suspects have been and still are detained from two up to even 12 years, to 12 years without a verdict, 12 years in this suspended state. This is a direct consequence of the many retrials we see here in Kosovo, trials starting again, over and over again. An issue that was also highlighted by the mission in our previous report last year. The report notes in particular the ineffective way how cases are processed, with many trials being dormant, literally asleep, for long periods of time, while the suspects are still being detained. This is not in anyone's interest. I would like to underline that today's report covers the entire period of the pandemic from March 2020 until November this year, 2021. But since the mission issued a special report on the impact of the pandemic on the rule of law in Kosovo in May this year, so about six months ago, there are only a few reference to the pandemic in the current report. Still, it goes without saying that the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, has continued to affect different aspects of rule of law throughout the period covered 
by today's report. For example, the slight increase in unproductive hearings during the reporting period can partly be explained by the ongoing pandemic. Unproductive hearings being when you call a hearing and someone doesn't show up and therefore you cannot hold it. It's very frequent, unfortunately, and not just due to the pandemic. Also, I would like to emphasize that since it was difficult at the time of the drafting of the special report on the effect of the COVID pandemic to obtain relevant and reliable data on domestic violence, this topic was not covered in the special report in May. The mission has continued following this important issue, which also relates to the implementation of the Istanbul Convention by Kosovo. And there is a dedicated section on the topic of access to justice for victims of domestic violence during the pandemic, including in today's report. However, there is still a lack of sufficient and reliable data on domestic violence cases here in Kosovo. So it's difficult to draw any definite and final conclusions and give recommendations. We hope to be able to do so next year. To conclude, today's report aims to add to the debate over how to improve the rule of law in Kosovo. It is based on factual observations, and I emphasize again, by EU member states experts who've come here to Kosovo representing their countries working under the logo of the EU rule of law mission. How to improve the Kosovo rule of law system and to analyze how it is operating. The recommendations we are making are not binding, but they are realistic and can have a positive effect on the efficiency, accountability and integrity of rule of law in Kosovo, if there is a willingness to implement them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador. Dear Minister, the floor, the floor is all yours. Palimderit per fiolan. In the Ruar Zoti Vigamark, Chef Oleksit, in the Ruar Kresus Zogai, in the Ruar Zoti Shabani, Zvens Kresus Ikshidit Procurial Kosovas, in the Ruar Zonia Rama, Zoti Sufai, in the Ruar Te Pranisham, Sidomos Media Chepo e Percielen, Kat Spalosiet, Raportit, Monitorimit, Dritsis, Chepo Publico, and Ga Missioni Oleksit. Sic besoi jenin dieni Ministria Drecis është përkushtuar që të shtyjë përpara agendën qeveritare në sundimin e ligjit dhe në avancimin e të drejtave të njeriut në Kosovë. Vizioni qeveris është drecia e pavarur, e panshme, efikase dhe profesionale dhe kjo synohet të arjet ma anë të fuqizimit të sistemit të drecis me që lem po ashtu rritje në besimit të qytetarve në institucionet e drejtsis. Në korikun e këti viti, si që po ashtu jeni ndjeni, Qeveria Republikës e Kosovës ka miratuar strategjin për sundimin e ligjit, i cili dokument ka dal nga rishikimi funksionali sistemit të drejtsis dhe për cilin ka ndë një kontribut shumë të madhë edhe shëqria civile edhe përfacus të institucioneve ekspert të ndryshëm dhe kjo strategi ka para par aktivitetet të ndryshme në drejtim të arritjes të prioriteteve qeveritare, si që janë parandalimi dhe luftimi krimit, respektimi të drejtave të njeriut, arritja e barazit gjinore, qasja në drejtësi, që po ashtu është njën nga elementet kyqet të strategjis për sundime e ligjit. Pra ndaj edhe strategjia ka rëndësit veçan për vetë se për Republikën e Kosovës edhe në procesin e integrimit evropian të Kosovës, nga se për me saj kontribohet drejt për drejt në zbatimin e mëso as. Po ashtu, përveç kësaj, ne emi duke punuar jarëzakonisht shumë për adresimin e krimeve të luftës dhe në këtë drejtim së bashku me prokurinë speciale kemi konsideruar që duhet të adresohet qështja e gjukimit munges 
për kriminalit e luftës, kë ndryshim është bërë, kë ndryshim ka hyrë në fuqi, dhe ta një pritet që i njëjt të zbatohet në përpik mëri. Po ashtu kemi shtuar kapacitetet në Prokurin Speciale Departamentin për katës për krimet e luftës, e gjithashtu jemi duke punuar në qështjen e dokumentimit të krimeve të luftës për mes mekanizmit të veçantë, ku do të dokumentohen gjitha krimet e luftës që ka ndodhë në Kosovë, por po ashtu jemi duke punuar edhe për strategjin për drejtsin transicionale, ndonëse në këtë të fundit jemi ende në fazat filestare. Po ashtu prioriteti qeveris tonë është adresimi i dhunës në familje, adresimi i dhunës në daj grave, adresimi i dhunës në baza gjinore, dhe për këtë nuk duhet të angazhojmi vetëm në këto 16 ditët të aktivizmit kunder dhunës në baza gjinore, por në se cilën ditë tonë. Pra nda edhe që nga momenti që kam pranuar dhe tyrën si Ministre Drejtsis, kemi zgjedhur Koordinatori Nacional kunder dhunës në familje, po ashtu e kemi funksionalizuar dhe i kemi bërë të regull të atakimet e grupit ndërministror ku institucionet vinë, marim përgjithësi dhe i kryen dhe tyrat të cilat i kanë. Ndonëse nuk jam shumë e knaqur me angazhimin institucional, s'po flasë këtu vetëm me institucionet qoftë policin apo të drejtsis, por edhe gjithë qeverin ku vendin e Kosovës, sepse për të adresuar një fenomen që është tjerë zakonisht i rënd dhe shumë i rëzikshëm duhet për bashkim dhe angazhim maksimal, sepse vetëm gjatë këti viti kemi pasur mbi dymi raset të dhunës në familje, konsiderohet që raportimi është ende i vogël, pra ndaj duhet të nëzisim raportimin, e po ashtu duhet t'i adresojmë si që duhet rastet e dhunës në familje. Për këtë edhe kemi adresuar ndryshimin në ligjin për ndim juridike falas, për t'i garantuar ndim juridike falas viktimave të dhunës në familje me bazë gjinore e dhunës në familje, pavarësir gjendjes të tyre socioekonomike. Sa i përket në veçanti strategjis për sundimin e ligjit, aty evidentohet që ka një progres, me gjitha të konsiderohet që ka të meta në administrimin e shpejt dhe efektiv të drejtsis, dhe si rjedhoj ka besim të ullët të publikut në institucionet e drejtsis. Dhe aty evidentohen problemet të shumëta. Për funksionimin e durë dhe të pavaru të gjysorit, konsideroj që janë katër elemente kyqe, e që janë efikasiteti, profesionalizmi, logaridhënja, integriteti, po ashtu pavarësia. Dhe konsideroj që nga problemet kryesore që me cilat aktualisht balafaqohet sistemi i drejtsis, dhe për cilat përmëndohëm që për gjithë ditë të angrisë së zërin, dhe kjo s'ka të bëj me individet për brenda sistemit drejtsis. Kjo ka të bëj me brengën ti me si ministre e drejtsis për problemet me cilat balafaqo sistemi drejtsis. Pra nda jam shumë e gatshme që të punoj gjithë ditë për adresimin e këtyre problemeve. Konsideroj që problem kryesor është sistemi të nushëm nda e këtërve të jashtëm. Ne ende nuk kemi arritur që ta kryojmë në sistem drejtsis ku nuk ndikohet asë nga individet, asë nga grupet e jashtëne. Dhe nuk po flasë këtu për gjithë gjyshtarët, asë për gjithë prokurorët, asë për gjithë policët. Po flasë për individ, brenda sistemit, të cilët ende duken që ndikohen nga jashtë. Logaridhe një pa mjaftushme, inkurajo institucionet që të punojnë në këtë rritim, nevoja për rritje të profesionalizmi dhe kompetences dhe vonesat në sistemin gjyqësor dhe atë prokurorial. Pra, këto janë gjetje që përmendin edhe në raportet vendore, edhe në raportet në ndërkomtare që bëjmë për vendin, pra ndaj duhet adresim i se cilës prej tyre. Ajo që Ministria Adresis është duke bërë tani në avancim të strategjis për sundimin e ligjit, dhe më thonë ka të bëj direkt me disa veprime, që është procesi i blersimit kalimtar të gjyshtarve dhe prokurorve, po ashtu ndryshimet në ligjim për këshidhin prokurial, ligjim për prokurorin e shtetit dhe ligjim për prokurin speciale, sa i përket kësaj të fundit, si qeni ndjeni ne kemi marë dhe një opinion të Komisionit të Venecias, i si ljep mundësin Ministrisë të Drejtsis që të bëj ulljen e numrit të antarve të këshidhit prokurial të Kosovës nga 3 djetë sa i ka aktualisht në shtatë, dhe po ashtu i njëjt i adreson edhe qështjen e ndërprejrës së mandatit të antarve aktual të këshidhit prokurial të Kosovës, nëse kjo siguron në depolitizim dhe në efikasitet të sistemi drejtsis. Dhe opinioni thot në qofë se jo, atër të pakten disa për i tyre të lijen që ta përfundojnë mandatin. Arsio apse po e drësoj edhe këtu është për shkak të shumë zërave 
që kanë keq ledzuar këtë opinion të Venecias, pra ndaj unë i fëtoj instrucionet e drejtsis që të nga ndihmojnë që kjo pako ligjore të bëhet sa më e implementushme dhe në shërbim të qytetarve, jo grupeve të interesit, jo individve. Pra ndaj edhe kemi thirur grupin punus të premtëm për t'i adresuar edhe rekomandimet që dalin nga Komisioni Venecias, gjithë një në përputhje me rekomandimet e Komisioni të Venecias. Po ashtu më lejoni që të shprehe edhe një breng që e kemi si Ministri e Drejtsis për faktin se takimet që i kemi me qytetarë të Republikës e Kosovës janë të shumëta dhe këtë e dinë edhe organizatat e shëqërisë civile që merën me këto qështje stërzgjatja e lëndëve pran institucioneve të drejtsis. Kjo është bërë e tepërt kur kjetë parasysh që qytetarët duhet presin minimum 6 vite, maksimum 10 e më shumë vite për adresimin e një lëndë e pran institucioneve të drejtsis. Pra ndaj ju lutem shumë edhe institucioneve të drejtsis që të adresojnë këtë problem shoqëror i cili po e mohon drejtsin dhe po e zbeh besimin e qytetarëve në institucionet e drejtsis. Dhe në fund fare, unë jam jashtë zakonisht e interesuar që të bashkëpunoj me institucionet e drejtsis për të mirën e qytetarëve të Republikës e Kosovës, për të mirën e Republikës e Kosovës. Dhe për këtë do të angazhohem gjithë dit të punës time në Ministrinë e drejtsis, do të bashkëpunojmë pa ndalë edhe me organizatat e shëqërisë civile të cilat e bëjnë një punë të jarë zakonshme në monitorimin e sistemi të drejtsis, po ashtu raportet si kjo që sot po shpaloset, janë jarë zakonisht të rëndësishme, unë konsideroj që është një raport profesional, dhe konsideroj që edhe për sistemin e drejtsis është shumë e mi pritur kur një trupe jashtme monitoran dhe profesionalisht para qëtë faktet mbi raste që kanë kaluar apo janë në procedur dhe në sistem dhe cilat raste kanë vëmendjen e gjerë pra të opinionit publik. Edhe njëherë zotohem para jush që do të punoj në vazhdimësi për adresimin e problemeve që kemi në sistemin e drejtsis, unë kam zgjatur dorën e bashkëpunimet dhe pres që të njëtën gjëta bëjnë edhe institucionet e drejtsis. Ju falenderoj shumë dhe pa dyshim që shemi edhe në takimet e tjera. Thank you very much. I would like now to invite the chief of ULEX's case monitoring unit to take the floor. He will be describing us the main findings and recommendations from the report. Hubert. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, I think I will go straight to the recommendations. We have quite a lot. Um, so first off, uh, I would like to mention the finding um, which highlights the observed overuse of detention on remand and the potential punitive effects that this may have. Following the criminal procedural code, detention on remand can only be ordered as a measure of last resort and be imposed for the shortest possible time. But detention on remand entails, like imprisonment, a deprivation of liberty, it must be strictly distinguished from it as detention on remand is a security measure aimed at ensuring the presence of the defendant, while imprisonment is a form of punishment, which can only be imposed after a judgment. The mission examined 68 decisions from different basic courts imposing detention on remand, which revealed that in a large number of cases, the initially imposed detention on remand was not upheld in the later stage of the proceedings. This suggests to us that the courts eventually assessed that the conditions for imposing detention on remand has ceased to exist in the course of the proceedings. This raises then the question whether the conditions for imposing this most impeding security measure existed in the first place and whether other, more lenient measures were even considered. These findings lead to the conclusion that detention on remand is often applied systemically and without proper justification and carries, intended or not, a punitive effect. And as just discussed this morning with Mr. McCauley, there is actually an additional concern, uh, which we didn't look at, but is very much true, that also detention costs money to the cost of our budget, which is an additional concern which was well noted. 
In addition to how the tension on remand is being imposed, the mission also looked into the excessive length of the tension on remand, as already highlighted by our head of mission, which raises indeed serious human rights concerns. The mission identified, as mentioned, 37 cases of individuals who have been detained until today, between two to up to even 12 years without a final judgment, and that is really a very long period. This is indeed a direct consequence of the many ordered retrials, also mentioned already by our head of mission, and was also mentioned in our previous Justice Monotone report. And it also is because of the ineffective way how cases are processed, as several trials have indeed been tormented for a long period of time, while suspects are still being detained. According to the European Court of Human Rights, as reasoned in the jurisprudence, pretrial detention of an accused person should not exceed a reasonable time. And it is therefore that we urge the authorities to ensure that the application of detention on remand must meet all standards of legality, necessity, and proportionality. A fixed systemic topic the mission is always looking into concerns the so-called unproductive hearings. As explained, these are hearings which are adjourned without any meaningful progress in the trial and which have a negative effect on the justice system as a whole, as it increases the length of proceedings and places an additional burden on the judiciary. Out of the 387 hearings that were monitored in the reporting period, 113 were unproductive, which equals to 30%. This constitutes a slight increase compared to the findings identified in the previous report. However, the effect of the pandemic in the current reporting period cannot be disregarded as a negative factor. Based on the findings from the first Justice Monitor report, in which roughly half of the hearings were actually marked as unproductive, the KGC at the time undertook, in coordination with the mission, several initiatives to address this phenomenon. However, due to the pandemic, this had to be put on hold and hopefully can be resumed in the near future. Another systemic finding concerns the recording of court proceedings. Based on our trial monitoring, it was identified that court recordings are always recorded in writing only, even though the law actually allows to actually audio record them. Reportedly, this is not being applied. This is not being applied due to lack of technical equipment in most courts. The problem with this is that hearings are then even further prolonged due to the need to produce written records. The judge, the parties, and the witnesses need to adjust the way they speak and are often interrupted or asked to repeat their statements. Thus, instead of directing the hearing, judges find themselves having to pay attention to the process of record taking. In addition, this practice hinders a meaningful cross-examination process and makes it more difficult for the public to follow the proceedings. Conducting audio recordings would significantly increase the efficiency of the court proceedings, which is particularly important given the fact that many court proceedings are not being held already within a reasonable time, as already mentioned several times. The next systemic topic, which I would like to highlight, concerns the role of public institutions as injured party, specifically in corruption cases. When defendants are charged with the criminal offense of abusing official position, and when the offense is claimed to have caused damage, an injured party must be identified and specified in the indictment. This is an essential part of a well-prepared indictment and also ensures the injured party's right to take part in the court proceedings. However, it was observed that the injured party is often not specified in the indictment. Moreover, it was also observed that public institutions identified as injured party often remain passive during the trial, proceed the trial proceedings, while they could significantly contribute to the successful completion of the proceedings. An example of this is the so-called veterans case, in which the prosecution assessed the damage caused by the defendants to be 68 million euros at the time of the environment and growing. The Ministry of Labor and Social Welfare as injured party, then represented by the State Advocacy Office, remained very passive in the proceedings and eventually all defendants were acquitted in this case. As a last systemic finding, I would like to highlight the lack of progress in the handling of several high profile and former ULEX cases. While some delays could be contributed to the pandemic, this was not the main cause for the observed delays. For example, several high profile cases were assigned to other trial panels and needed to therefore start again from the beginning. Others did progress and even ended with a judgment, but were then overturned by the Court of Appeals and sent back for retrial. And this happened sometimes over and over again. 
Concrete examples of such cases can be found in the report. Also last summer, some serious crimes judges in charge of high profile cases at the Basic Court Pristina informed that several of their cases should be dealt with by the special department. And therefore they stopped holding trials, again leading to trials not being organized. In addition, such a transfer would, in our view, not even be legally possible. However, this was then in November clarified by the Judicial Council, and it was agreed that some former ULES cases, mostly high profile cases, belonging to the Serious Crimes Department of Basic Court Pristina, would be dealt with by judges from the Special Department, but in their capacity as Serious Crimes judges, which would be in line with the law. In several other high profile former ULES cases, such as the so called Drenica and Land 4 case, not one hearing has been held after the cases were actually handed over by ULEX in 2018. The mission recommends to make sure that courts do not further delay the handling of former and other high profile ULEX cases in order to avoid the impression that the Kosovo judiciary is not fully ready to adjudicate such cases, but also to concretely avoid such cases becoming possibly statutory barred. This is a concern which was also identified in a recently published report by the Kosovo Law Institute and also just mentioned by the Minister. Regarding our thematic monitoring, I would start with the findings of our monitoring of corruption, also already highlighted by the head of mission in relation to the former anti-corruption task force and the current renamed Special Investigation Unit. As a consequence of our reporting last year and the concerted effort by the international community, the task force, now special investigation unit, still exists. However, there are indications that the future of the investigation unit is still being debated as part of upcoming reforms. And in this light, the mission would like to emphasize that whatever the future of this special investigation unit holds, it has to be ensured that all the current roughly 50 confirmed investigations will not be compromised as part of any legal or organizational reform. As already mentioned, as part of the lack of progress in handling of high profile cases, several of the affected cases which are not progressing or which face other obstacles are actually corruption related cases. Another thematic topic the mission looked into is the handling of cases concerning crimes under international law. Some progress was noted in the work of the Kosovo Police War Crimes Investigation Unit with regard to the operationalizing of the war crimes databases, a database which ULEX helped in establishing a so, couple of years ago. Also, as already mentioned by the Minister, the SPRK War Crimes Department uh, enlarged, which also was a, possible, a positive observation from our side, and several new investigations were opened. Unfortunately, only one indictment was filed in the reporting period. I think the main obstacle for the SPRK, just like ULEX was facing in its executive period, is that many suspects remain abroad and therefore could not be investigated and arrested. The Special Department at Basic Corp Pristina was actually able to finalize all pending war crimes cases, while the cases, the war crimes cases, currently adjudicated before Basic Corp Mitrovica and prison are not progressing at all. The mission observed some shortcomings in the quality of the judgments regarding crimes under international law, particularly first instance judgments when it concerns the legal reasoning and the imposing of sentences. We therefore believe it would be of benefit for judges to receive targeted training on the specifics of reasoning of judgments concerning crimes under international law. A last practical observation monitored before Basic Court Pristina is that often, unfortunately, translations of court files could not be provided in a timely manner, which resulted in significant delays of the trials. In order to assess the implementation of the functioning of the Case Management Information System, or CMIS, the mission visited in the reporting period all basic courts and also all branch courts. Relevant examples of the features of CMIS are the interoperability between the basic courts and basic prosecution offices, but also the automatic case assignment. Especially the latter is an important feature, as in the past the mission had some concerns in relation to the case assignment and this feature significantly reduces the risk of undue influence. It was observed that the automatic case assignment is in principle functioning well in all courts and branches since its introduction in February 2020. Overall, it is assessed that the development and rollout of CMIS in all courts has been successful and that the system has gained the trust of many court users. However, due to the complexity and lack of sufficient resources, the system is not fully functional everywhere. 
This is mostly the case in the branch courts, where, for example, due to slow internet connections, the system is slowed down significantly. Last but surely not least are the findings on gender-based violence. With regard to cases of sexual integrity offenses, ULEX continued monitoring several cases of rape and observed that the referral procedure of victims to the Institute of Forensic Medicine for medical examination, although improved, is still not consistent and still depends too much on the engagement of the prosecutor in charge. Also, there are no specialized investigators within the Kosovo police dealing with sexual integrity offenses, as is the case with domestic violence cases. In connection to this, it is very important that standard operating procedures regulating the cooperation between all service providers involved in sexual violence cases are established. Such, produce, such procedures would then define the respective roles of the Kosovo police, prosecution, courts, the Institute of Forensic Medicine, health professionals, the Victims Advocacy Office, and Centers for Social Welfare. As also mentioned by our head of mission, <coughs> since ULEX issued a special report on the impact of the pandemic on the rule of law, there are in general no references to the effect of the pandemic in this report. As it was difficult in the time of the drafting of the COVID report to obtain relevant and reliable data on the effect of the pandemic on domestic violence, this topic was not covered at the time in the special report. Therefore, the mission continued looking into this and a dedicated section is included in this report. Unfortunately, the collection of data still proved to be challenging, given that Kosovo lacks a comprehensive system of collection of domestic violence data, and therefore no clear evaluations could be drawn. What could be identified is that there has been a constant increase in case of domestic violence reported to the Kosovo police since 2017, every year more and more. Therefore,